your host, Ann Kelly. Today's featured guest is Croy Williamson. He is a visual artist. We also have back on the show as a guest host, Talia Kosh. If you saw episode four, you've met Talia. If you didn't, you should go back and watch. In the meantime, Talia is a singer, songwriter, and art lawyer. Welcome, Croy. Welcome, Talia. Hello, so, how's it going? So we're all in Santa Fe, but all in different places because the world's real weird right now. But um, where in Santa Fe are you, Croy? On can the you... south of Santa Fe by the Best Western Plus at my studio. <laughs> and, and, and Talia, where are you at? I'm in the Casa Solana area. Croy and I met in college way back when. And so the, the show is actually named after an art show that we used to have in college, Art in the Raw, where we'd show unfinished art. So this is um, not the same as that, but I wanted it to have kind of the same spirit. And I don't remember specifically, but you must have been at a bunch of those shows, Croy. You're, yes, you're I, I was definitely there at every single one of those shows. Yes, it was fun. Of course you were. Did you usually bring art or, or make it at the show? I did both. Definitely did both. I remember specifically Art in the Raw where I was experimenting with melting crowns and I was painting a painting with melting crowns. That was that was pretty cool. And I've never, but I haven't experimented with that again since then. But yeah. And then we also, I remember, I remember playing Stump, an old blacksmith's game. I think Jeremy Thomas, he's the one that brought a stump. And so you flip the, the hammer and it, catch it in your hand. If you catch it, and then you swing and knock a na your neighbor's nail in. Whoever whoever got their nail knocked in first was out of the game or something like that. But I don't exactly. know if I can play that, but that sounds kind of amazing. <laughs> it's a drinking game. I wanted to know how you both met each other in college. That That's actually a fun story. It was literally the first day that we'd moved to the dorms. And I was just walking around and I heard someone playing the Misfits. And it was Croy. And I like ran and I popped my head in his room and I was like, Misfits, you're awesome. And I started running down the hallway and he came back out and was like, who are you? And then, and then we mm -hmm. became friends after that. Friends never. I vaguely do remember that. And then we lived together in, in what we called the big house out in La Cienega. That was and crazy that was, time. That, yeah. that was a fun house. Everybody that lived in the house was an artist, but you were painting and Gina was painting and we had this yeah. giant living room that was all tile thank god because both you and Gina would have like 10 paintings going at a time and yeah, um, yeah. If there had been carpet that could have been real bad yeah yeah that was when I was pouring paint and scraping it and making really trippy stuff I don't have any of those paintings left they're all sold to different people but yeah well I do remember when I was experimenting with resin epoxy on a painting and it never dried in the garage. I was going to bring that up actually. <laughs> uh, that was terrible. And then of course I scraped off all the resin except there was a thin layer of resin and I just stuck it outside and it dried immediately like in the sun. I guess it was activated by the sun but I was goofball and didn't realize how that worked. Anyways like because just in the darkness in the garage, it just never dried. And it, oh, that smell, remember? I, remember I mean, it must have been like a month. Or longer. It was, yeah, it was probably longer than a month. <laughs> it's a really cool painting. Yeah, I know. Actually, you know what? I painted a painting over that. And actually, Sean has that painting that I painted over. And because it was resin, the resin is chipping off. So that painting is chipping but yeah, you, you and Gina really have 10 canvases each out and both of you would be running from canvas to canvas, just, just painting. It sounds like an interesting process of going from painting to painting, from canvas to canvas, instead of focusing on one. Yeah, that's kind of... Is that how you work? That's, yeah, I mean, I still do that, yeah. I usually am working on a bunch of stuff at the same time, a ton of stuff, yeah. Do you have so. any work out now that, that you're currently working on? Well, yeah, I can show you some, uh, I can show you uh, this painting that I'm working on and I'll show you some drawings and 
and uh, all sorts of stuff. So, so this is a painting I'm working on right now, and it's really challenging because I'm trying kind of a different method, I'm kind of messing with color theory, and it's not so much lines because a lot of my artwork has a lot to do with the lines, you know, and there is still the black lines here, but I'm trying to experiment with getting, you know, with the different plain colors playing off each other. And I, since I haven't painted with acrylic like this in so long, it's been very challenging. So I'm still working on this one. And, you know, and I got this one, I, I started and haven't finished, you know. That one reminds me a little bit of some of your Sumi drawings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, cause I do, I do these drawings of these cities constantly. Uh, in these weird cityscapes with little hills, kind of cartoony. Uh, and these are actually, these are all um, spray paint paintings that I haven't figured, I haven't come to a conclusion with them yet. So they're kind of, and, and they're a little different, you know, you know, and this, this too as well, I have not come to a conclusion with yet. Maybe I will, maybe I won't, but uh, I don't know, you know, that's kind of how it goes um so you usually hang them up for a while spend a little time with them and sometimes they they're quick sometimes they take time and sometimes i never finish them but <laughs> <laughs> it seems like and this is a well that's already finished that is a finish that and, and this is a assemblage piece well so how, and, how do you know when they're done i just know you just know when they're done this is a finished piece uh, and it's kind of like in the cartoony city, stylized cities, you know, and this one's done, you know, and that's kind of different, a little st st different, messing with different styles, you know, kind of a mess here. A challenge huh? that a lot of artists have know knowing when they're done. Like, is it, when, when do you stop? Um, but I think it's also like, how do you know when you love a piece of art? And I always defer to, you just know it when you see it. So mm -hmm. it's like, yeah you're lucky to have kind of that experience with your own artwork you know okay yeah yeah what, what would you say your influences are i feel like an mc escher vibe to some of your stuff is that offensive uh no i mean i love mc escher i mean who doesn't love mc escher i am influenced by all the art i see in the world i i love art i i even collect some even though i don't usually i do like trades with people or i got a couple little I got pieces up print my some of my friends pieces here but um and I'm always looking at art always looking at online always looking all around so I'm influenced by all sorts of people um it, from you know I, I love graffiti art I love uh see I mean um MC Escher course but also like lately I've been thinking about and pondering like Luis Nevelson and like uh Lee Bontecu a lot and that's sculptural work but it's all it's all related you know to me so i also look at a lot of like Lebus woods i think that's how they say his name he's like an architect and does really incredible or he's he's not around anymore but he did all these really wild architectural conceptual art pieces that were just off the charts i don't know there's a lot of people i could go on and on. We're actually doing some graffiti pieces on a wall outside your studio, or you're going to. You mentioned the other day. When I'm going to make, I, lo I love doing murals. I'm going to make myself a graffiti mural wall that I can just paint murals on to get faster with spray paint because I love spray paint. There's not like a lot of walls to spray paint here in Santa Fe. Like there was in Austin, we had a graffiti, because that's where I'm from originally. We had a graffiti wall, so I would go spray paint there all the time. And, uh, and I've done some murals here and there for people, but I don't get too many opportunities to do that. And- right. uh, You're not trying to get arrested. Doing yeah, and I don't, well, yeah, I'm like, I'm, I, yeah, I never, I mean, I have done a little bit of illegal graffiti, but no, I don't really get into that because that's not what my goal is. Uh, you know, I, I like to make pieces and not run from the cops. You don't have to worry about it, you know? Cause that's, uh, that's just, you know, I'm, I'm not in it for the rush like that per se, like some people are. And, and I think that's cool, whatever you want, you know? Um, but yeah. Working in spray paint versus acrylic paint. How, how is that physically different? Oh, well, you know, spray paint is so much 
faster in a lot of ways. Um, you know, cause you, it, but it's, it's, it's definitely challenging, like to get the small details, which, you know, some of those guys have such incredible coordination with that spray paint. You know what I mean? They get the details, which I'm working on that. A lot of times I use like uh, stencils, tape and stuff to get nice little corners. And, and then I use like, like I cut out shapes, you know, and, and stack them on there to get the details, you know, and I did buy an airbrush so that I could experiment with that, but I haven't spent very much time messing with that. So um, it's definitely a different experience. What I love about it is uh, cause my, I do, I, I like the gestural kind of flow, you know? So like I'm very gestural, so I can move with a spray paint, uh, you know, these big long strokes and get these nice lines and, and it feels real good. You know, it's like almost like, I guess it would kind of, you could kind of think of it like Tai Chi or something, you know, just like doing these cool lines and shapes, you know, it's so fun and satisfying to me. I, I, it's for my style, the way I do it, I like, it's kind of really fast and gestural. I went and spray painted it at the graffiti park in um, Austin, Texas, and uh, it was, it was so freaking satisfying, like this paint coming out of your fingertip, you know, and you could just, and I was like, oh my God, it kind of just blew my mind open, and I can't wait to start painting with it again, it's been a while since I moved to Santa Fe, and so, yeah. Well, you said you've got that wall up back, so. Yeah, I'm, I will be. Uh, but I haven't built it yet. I, I got just a, I don't want to spray paint on the wall. That I'm going to build a wall so I don't destroy the property that I'm living at. A very adult of you. <laughs> yeah. I try to be a, uh, responsible, right? Hey, do you have any metal sculptures? We haven't really have, talked about the metal sculpture. Oh, yeah. So I have some, some, a couple of new pieces. So here is a couple of different metal sculptures that I have made recently. Yeah, these are welded steel sculptures. What, what kind of welding is this known as? These two are MIG welding. That's the, that's the welding with the gun and it was a wire feed. Kind of the easiest way to weld, I guess they would say. So there's MIG and stick and TIG. This is more, I. This is 20 gauge, so it's really thin. So welding it with a MIG welder is pretty ridiculous because there's a lot of grinding involved. Just recently got a TIG welder so that I can make more because my rolling machine is a hand powered one and it's not strong enough to roll more than 22 gauge or something, or 20 gauge, I guess. So, and that's how I roll those forms to make them nice and smooth. If I don't, if, if I, don't use the rolling machine. I have to use a hammer and which I'll go, I'll show you what I do to make those. When I, I use a hammer with two bars, when we go into my shop, I'll show you. And this is an older piece. This is all interconnected conical and constructions. So these are all these cones that are slotted and I slotted them together and welded them and grinded them. So, and, and you can, so these are all loose from each other, but they're stuck together permanently, of course. Um, it was pretty fun to make, it, but it really difficult. I cut all this by hand, you know, and I'll show you some examples so you can see the process of how I made that in the other room in this room over here i have yeah so so it's slotted together like that so i could take this thing completely apart it's kind of difficult because it's a three-quarter circle so it's kind of hard to get it past it but i can get it apart and i have some i have a really small one that i can take apart completely because it's a half circle so this so that's kind of fun and then this over here, so you can kind of see right here. So this is a, this, I'll put it in this light. So this is a half circle and these, so these come apart and this oh, is made wow. out of brass. See, that's see? very MC Escher right there. <laughs> see, yeah, these are kind of these crazy complicated things I like to make. And I just, and I have some in my, I have a gallery up in Colorado and, 
called um, uh, Sea Waters Gallery. And she has my larger, I have a larger version of this over there. Uh, these are some other sculptures. <laughs> See, I like to make stuff really difficult. So this is 80 something pieces. It's all TIG welded and grinded. And, uh, and, it's, and it's just took forever, you know, cause I like to make my life difficult. And then this one is kind of fun. So this is a, if you can see it. So this is a sculpture uh, made out of one inch plate and I pressed it, it's two spirals together, but I fused them together so that it looks like it's made out of one continuous piece. And I, and I cut back into the weld so it, you can't tell where it's welded basically. So it's kind of like an impossible thing, kind of an impossible spiral. So, so if you see it, it goes around and around and back under and then comes around here. So it's kind of fun. And I've made some larger pieces. They're gone now and I sold them. But this is actually, this is the, I think this is the last of those, which I'm gonna make some more soon. So is that so, a thing you do smaller version and then expand it into a larger? Eventually I want to make a large, really large version, but actually a lot, oftentimes like I, for this one down here, actually even for this one, I made a larger one first because that's, and then I made a small one. Uh, yeah, it's kind of funny because I always go for it a little too much. Go for the bigger piece and then I realize I had to rethink it. Like the first one of those I made actually came out really gr good in a way, but some of my calculations were off. So it was really like kind of, it came together really in a, in a weird way, slightly really tight. Mm -hmm. And it almost looked like a, like a piece of a, large bug you know that was lying on the ground and you know what i mean that, that maybe like a like a well segment of it and it was really kind of crazy that one is that one resides in new zealand now at my old art dealer she bought it from me and i should show you these other things paintings and other sculptures if these i made in creed this one i made in austin a while ago this is spray paint see uh, how it's all I uh, did it with masking tape and mm -hmm. and uh, stencils this one I made live like I did a live painting session sometimes they come together really fast this came together so fast and then this one and then these these are some other works which these are all digital paintings so if you can see it kind of, oh, and I guess these are all on my website too. So. Normally we would have pulled up the Instagram by now, but you've got yeah. some interesting things. Well, I like to make my space colorful and kind of a, an experience, you know, I, cause I like to live in the painting, you know what I mean? So that's why I got so many colored lights. I love colored lights. Some color combinations work really well for me in particular. So like I see it and I'm like, holy shit, you know? That is it, you know? It's a, kind of an intuitive thing, I think, you know what I mean? The certain patterns, color combinations, just the composition, right? Just like in songs, some stuff goes together well, some stuff doesn't, right? I've, I've always deferred to intuition in terms of what I like, what I don't like. I know it when I see it, and sometimes you can't even articulate it for years or ever. Yeah, for sure. If you own artwork by any artist, living or dead, any price range, no limits. Yeah. What would it be? Yeah, what would it be? I really like this artist, Rhyme. Uh, he's an incredible graffiti artist. When I first saw his work, it kind of just blew my freaking mind because he's just so gestural and like, but so tight and you're just if if look him up i love his stuff i would have a piece of his i would also have probably a Luis nevelson piece there's this one piece in particular i really love it looks like it's made out of stone this black stone it looks like it's made out of basalt and for some reason like that piece i don't know i've been looking at it i keep i keep uh 
looking her up just to see that piece probably because i have a big chunk of a big basaltic river rock that i got to to do stone lifting with it's a little heavy for me now or i might carve it i don't know haven't decided <laughs> anyways exercise or stone <laughs> lifting thing <laughs> yeah yeah it's stone lifting is they call it an atlas stone it's like a strong man thing you oh. know yeah yeah so you know working with iron and all that kind of stuff you want to be you want to keep your strength so i do stuff like lifting stuff to keep my strength even though i don't do it enough to like be a big strong person but trying to get back into it i've been kind of off lately but my friend i had my friend is the one that's kind of got me into it one day because we went down to the um uh, Diablo Canyon and he was showing me about this rock lifting and we were out there lifting rocks and I felt like I was like a, in the really old days like how was, people would work out back in Rome in the, in the mountains yeah like so you know. cooler than the gym so it's so beautiful out there and incredible like landscape and you're lifting rocks it's kind of it's, it's a little safer in a way than rock climbing because you can't fall. Of course, you could screw your back up. You got to be careful, but but it's to also it kind of helps you strengthen your back, you know. And to Greg Robertson too, who was also on your show. We should do like a, a rock lifting art in the raw. I'll bet you he can lift stones for sure. So I was going to take you to my shop, my metal yeah, shop. If you please. Want. Okay, so we're going to my backyard. It's going to get dark here. So, so while we're walking there, Talia, if you could have any piece of art in the world. I would say uh, I would love to have a piece from William Eggleston mm. or Agnes Martin or Juliette Clovey, who is actually more accessible than those other two artists. Um, I found her a couple of years ago. She's a sculptural artist and I just love her stuff. She's French. What about you? I gotta say, if I could have a piece by M.C. Escher, that, that I would be pretty excited about that, to be perfect. Yeah, that'd be a good investment, too. Yeah, yeah. So we're going with M.C. Escher, for sure. We're going to photography. Man Ray is, is one of my favorite photographers of all times, and I definitely cannot afford one of his um, pieces. So yeah, we'll with Man Ray, because we're making it this, up. This is my metal shop. And I was going to show you this piece that I am working on right now. It's going to be a rainstorm and see the clouds not there on the top. But you can kind of see I got it kind of to the slant like it's coming down with the wind. And so this is my studio. It's a it's a big mess. I just finished the project in here. And also it's just a mess because it's really tight. Well, um, and you're using it. Yes. And I haven't swept and. <laughs> so don't judge me anyways that's the way it is and this is another piece doing a little different thing with this thing you'll see when i finish it but i'm messing with some different ideas be all welded up and then i'm going to cut it and stagger it and give it some crazy dimension some different kind of treatment so it's it's an experiment so is there a final patina for these yeah these i mean i usually blacken them and see you see the dings on this because this is thicker i can't roll it in my roller see i do that with a hammer and i have a piece of and then i i hammer it in between this thing so i hammer it in here like to get it round so it takes time a little bit of hammering just cold Cold forging, which is actually supposedly it's a terrible idea, but, but I, anyways, anyway, yeah. And so, and then I have all these other projects, pieces and stuff that I've never finished. And then someday I'll finish that little piece back there and, you know, other pieces, crazy thing. That's where the magic happens in my mess. It's I love it. cool to see inside your studio. I love it. Next summer I'll be putting, I'll be building an awning. It's looking what? pretty sweet right now, I got to say. Yeah, I just need room. Well, I have, a, I have all the parts to make an English wheel, and I really want to do that so I can form, do some more organic forms. 
So what is an English wheel? Use it to make fenders and stuff like that to get those round. And what it does is it's, it's a machine that is used to stretch the metal in a oh, compound curve. Or... Well, that's one of the interesting things about, about welding over the years is it's had this artistic application, but, you know, it's used in cars, it's bridges. You had a, a metal shop in, in Austin that you owned or co-owned. I was business partners in it. Yeah, we made a, we did a lot of architectural ironwork. Um, and we did a lot of, uh, so architectural stuff. We would also do like, like uh, just custom, you know, things that people wanted. Or sometimes people would come to us for like, cause they had some kind of invention or kind of thing that they wanted made this kind of custom, all sorts of stuff. We did a, just, Oh, uh, we, we did a lot of signs too, signs, metal signs for people. Um, and we did a lot of handrails, gates, lots of fancy gates. And it was a, an experience. So we, me and my friend, uh, Ryan Scott Nairns, we started that business. Shoot. I don't know what year it was, but I, I was, we were, we, when I left, I had, we had been working on it for about five years mm -hmm. and really I would say Ryan was, he owned it because he did all that stuff that I couldn't, I didn't want to do. So he was the big dog, you know, <laughs> like the he, administrative stuff. Yeah, he, or... He's very, I mean, he is very responsible okay. and good at the administrative stuff. And also like he was really good at explaining pe to people how to do stuff and, you know, like he was really good to, at working with people. I was challenged at that part, like running guys, running the crew. I was very challenged. I'm, I'm, I'm a really good fabricator. And I mostly, by the end of it, I ended up being like the finisher. And, you know, I did a lot of painting and clear coating and, and grinding and finishing out, trying to make everything look good, you know, in the end, you know. You guys, you want them welding. You want them doing all the the rough stuff, and then I would finish it. You know, like and patinas and collaboration is kind of awesome. I mean, everybody's going to have different skill sets, and if you can kind of get with other people that have different skill sets, you can kind of make something beautiful. And yeah, you know, maybe you're you're more talented at at x aspects of the thing and then he, he was maybe more the the business side of it but together well, he's, he's also an incredible fabricator himself he actually went to welding school see i went to art school so i i mean i i learned a lot from working with him because he like he's the kind of guy you could go you know you could ask him a technical question and he will have the answer for you. He's got that kind of brain that stores that kind of technical knowledge, you know? So, yeah. So it was really nice to have somebody like that to work with. Cause I just kind of go for it, even though I don't know how to do it. You know what I mean? I just try to figure it out, but you know, I could always go to him and tell, ask him, you know, Oh, how would I do that? You know what I mean? Or, or what is the right, what is the right order of, of things to do, you know? So it, like, it was really, it was really a great learning experience working with that guy. And um, cause he is just like, you know, one of those people, you can just pick his brain. He'll explain it to you six different ways and you'll, you know, and you'll get it, you know, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but I think a lot, you know, and, and that why what is what kind of why I go back to the collaboration sometimes there's people who are really good at explaining things and then there's other people um like you that you're just going to do it you're just going to go for it you're like I don't know if making a giant version of this makes any sense but you're just going to do it and I think some people are going to be held back by by fear or I don't know how to do this or or that type of thing so I think it's all valuable and and we're all different and yeah yeah for sure. Like, yeah, when I was making this thing, I realized, see, this is another example of me not making a small version first. <laughs> and I, I just made this giant one. And I'm like, God, why didn't I? 
God, I could have worked out some things, you know, <laughs> but I just went for it and made the big ass one. But I have, I still want to make a smaller one. I got some, I got a little footprint to make a small, really dramatic one. I am going to make a tabletop cloud um, once I finish this thing, you know, but I got so many projects on, on the horizon. So I yeah. geeked out a little bit earlier before we started recording. Are you familiar with this, the iron pillar in Delhi? Because it was apparently erected in India in 310 AD and is one of the earliest examples of welding. And I mean, hmm. I am no expert, but as I understood it, and I could be wrong, uh, the guy wanted to create this particular piece of art and I think, again, don't quote me, I think welding was kind of born out of his desire to create this pillar. Oh, wow. And that just reminded me, looking at your, your, your rank pillar. Oh, yeah. Um, I, have not, I have not seen that, but I really want to see that. That sounds exceptional. Yeah, it's like everything we kind of end up talking about the show dates way far back. I mean, 310 AD. Wow. We're in 2020. Yeah, and, that's a long time. That's a good, that's a long time ago. <laughs> that's cool. That they, I wonder how they were, I guess, I wonder how they were welding back then. Well, who knows, you know, uh, Andy, that's in India? India. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I always, I watch a lot of stuff about India. That's, that place is so ancient and they've been doing that stuff for so long mm -hmm. and it's mind boggling. Yeah. I seen some really crazy things. Over See, there. I can't help it. On Talia's episode, I started looking back at the history of, of ukuleles and learned some interesting things. And um, I love that. Yeah. I can't. I can't help myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's so much to learn about. I, I I watch a lot of documentaries and look at ancient art from all over the world. And yeah. I love that stuff. Actually, I got a friend, he works at a gallery here in town and it, they got like Mesoamerican art, pre-Columbian art and all that. And it's, it's cool to just go in there and check it out and and uh, want, you just want those things. <laughs> super, yeah, yeah, super ancient stone carvings. You're like, oh, I want that, you know? Yeah, the history yeah. of what, what you're, what we're doing. Well, that's yeah. all doing, came from. Yeah. And yeah. So, so, so Talia, one of her passions on top of music, she's a lawyer that is interested in art cases, uh, an art lawyer, among other types, um, different, different kind of art related cases that are going on. And, and you said, and we talked about a few of those on the last show. Um, yeah, has, has, has anything happened with those cases? Nothing in further development on the ones that we talked about, but there was a couple interesting ones. And I thought, you know, because the, there is um, some graffiti elements to your work, I, I was just reviewing this one landmark uh, case. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it called Five Points. Five Points was this artist, um, basically this artist colony in uh, Brooklyn or in Queens actually. And it was a sprawling building complex and the landlord allowed all of these different artists to uh, graffiti everything, like every part of the exterior and probably interior because a lot of them live there was graffitied and he allowed this for years and years and years. And then one day, it kind of reminded me of, um, of the situation that you guys lived in in college, but on in a on a bigger scale, and one day all of the artists woke up and he had whitewashed the entire building complex in the night, destroying all of the graffiti, you know, without warning. And uh, his argument was, "It's my building, it's my property." But we do have this act called the Visual Artists Rights Act. The artists used to sue him and they actually won. Jury um, 
found for the artist. And then the judge actually uh, gave them a, a, an over $6 million verdict, which was huge. And this kind of, you know, begs a lot of questions about, you know, the difference between graffiti and mural work is the, the permission element, right? So there was permission given here. So, you know, we're not talking about illegal works of art. And the Visual Artist Rights Act protects murals on the exterior of buildings where you have to give the artist notice. You have to try to allow them some time to remove it if they can, or at least preserve it in photographs. And so the uh, landlord appealed this case to the US Supreme Court and they just declined to hear the case, which means it's over, the landlord has to pay the 6.75 million and, um, yeah, so that was a really big win for um, muralists wow. and artists around America. And if what did that go on for? See, 2013 is when he whitewashed. And then 2018 is when the appeals court ruled. So it's been a while. I mean, these things go on forever. Sounds like that guy was a super dick. Super dick. So what these cases do is send a message to landlords uh, to property, commercial property holders all over the country. And it kind of sends a double message, right? It sends a double message of like, don't give permission <laughs> to paint on your walls, but it also sends a message that if you do, you know, hey, yeah, you can go ahead and paint a mural on that. You can't just go in the night and paint over it or destroy it. Um, you have to take measures to contact the artists and see if they can remove it. If you're destroying the building, see if they can remove it you know, or at least murals are often hard to remove. So sometimes it's not possible, but they could at least try and they could have been notified. You've said it's kind of rare generally also that um, the artists would even come forward. Most, most of the times his tenants would have just gone, okay, well, he's the landlord and they wouldn't have actually taken action. That's right. Yeah. His, his problem was that there were so many of them, right. And they all got a single attorney. It's not great money for, uh, you know, the number of artists that were a part of this case, but the precedent that it sets is pretty big. How many artists? Um, I would have to look it up, but I mean, it's, this was a sprawling building complex and there are a lot of, um, you know, artists work with spaces. So it's, there's a ton of them. The judge was the one, he handed down a hundred page opinion, counted each artwork, which ended up being 45 works that were destroyed and awarded a damages amount on each one, which is pretty cool too. So yeah, it's a, it's a good decision. It's solid. And the, the Supreme Court decided not to review it. And, you know, we have, we have really strong, um, versus other countries, strong copyright and fair use law, but like European countries have better moral rights than we do. So, you know, the, there's moral rights in this case, you know, the, the right to prevent your work from being destroyed, the right to associate your name with your work or to remove the association of your name with a work. Um, and there's another one that's just sort of similar in Norway right now, just kind of looking at the contrast. The Norwegian government has started to tear down this, this old, pretty historic building in uh, Oslo that had Picasso's two Picasso murals in it. And they did remove those murals and move them to another place. And there's been a ton of protests about this because they're saying, that the building um, is brutalist architecture, which is concrete, and that the building should be preserved and that P Picasso intended, it was a site specific artwork and that the, the artwork should not be separated from the building that they belong together. And the building was destroyed in a, um, a car bomb, a terrorist car bomb back in 2000, uh, 2011. And so they see it as like a, a symbol of you're tearing down a building that should be a symbol of democracy, right? So that's kind of interesting too, because, you know, with the, like the, the five points case that we, we just talked about, the protection is around the artwork. But in this case, the, the request is for a protection of a building, 
And so, you know, and like in the US, we have protection for architectural designs, but not necessarily the buildings in those designs. Can you can you say you can't tear this down because because it's a work of art, right? Because there's a functional element to that. So kind of interesting. I thought I'd bring those two cases up. Yeah, super interesting. Wow. Uh, That's cool. So Croy, if you what? painted a mural at the College of Santa Fe and they wanted to move it, would you feel strongly about that? I painted a mural in Creed, Colorado in this uh, restaurant bar and it was really, you know, my, my crazy style. And then, and eventually they, they uh, took most of it out except for a chunk of it because all, because in Creed, it's a lot of old people live there and they kind of like it traditional and Western, you know, and they, <laughs> they thought it was too outrageous. And I had to let go of that. Uh, and that's it. I mean, it, it does not feel that good, but what are you going to do? You know, I don't know. It's on a wall in somebody's restaurant and the, uh, you know, all, the young people liked it, but the, some of the, there's a lot of like traditional, you know, um, keep it the same because it's kind of got this minor history like it, it's a mining town it's roughneck cowboy you know what I mean and my painting is real wild and abstract and stylized so you know I don't know uh, I've dealt with this so yeah I mean it, it hurts for a minute but I let go whatever I mean those kind of things are kind of temporary. It's a temporal experience. It was awesome. It was fun to paint. And I took a lot of pictures. Uh, the owner of the restaurant, he kept a big chunk of it he, and framed it in his house. So it's kind of cool. Actually, I painted a mural in a friend's house in Arizona. And the guy that owned the house cut the, <laughs> cut the mural out and kept it when he sold the house <laughs> i would and say that's, that's a big fun. honor honestly yeah. so there there it was maybe still is actually a mural by a famous graffiti artist on the college campus uh shepherd fairy is that shepherd fairy mural still there does anybody know i hope it is that's a good question yeah mm -hmm. i think we need to find out I and it's a disarray so who knows Actually, um, so David Scheinbaum, he was one of the, he was the head of the photo department there. And I think he might've actually had something to do with that mural. I'm not exactly sure, but he's, he's going to be on the show next week. So I'll ask him, yeah. but I hope it's still there. And if it's not there, it better be somewhere. Probably um, worth a lot of money. There was the Arco Santi, um, or uh, not Arco Santi, Paulo Soleri Amphitheater. Paulo created Arco Santi. They had that Paulo Soleri Amphitheater at the um, that other college in town that they that they tore down or were going to tear down or Did they tear it down finally. They haven't had shows there in a really long time. It's just falling apart. Yeah, yeah. But at one point they were actively going to tear it down. I mean, I know they tore down a lot of buildings. They were tearing down trees. They I saw a cage match there. <laughs> a cage, a cage fight. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> Apollo. That's so yeah. cool. I saw my first concert at Apollo. You guys oh, remember wow. it? Tiffany? I think we we're alone now. You oh saw Tiffany? <laughs> One of the first under five cassette tapes I owned was was a Same. Tiffany. Yeah. Cassette tape. Me, me too. You too? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No. Really. <laughs> of of all of the live shows, one that stands out or or a favorite. Was it the Tiffany show, Talia? <laughs> no, uh, I would say Biggie Smalls. Ooh. I saw that an attorney at CIG with Naughty by Nature and a bunch of other uh, acts at, um, in Albuquerque when I was, I was 17. That was pretty cool. Yeah. So I would I'm say that. Tell us of that show. Yeah. For sure. What about you, Cry? My, my favorite show of all time was ministry Ooh. at the uh, La Zona Rosa in Austin, Texas. Nice. And it was awesome. And they had the chain link fence in front of them and it was crazy, crazy show. 
I so. gotta say, of all of the things I'm kind of missing, I think live music miss that almost more than anything. Actually, um, I was supposed to see ministry this summer. In the rail yard park, every Saturday night during the summer, we would have different free concerts. And those were really amazing. So I'm really hoping to get those back next summer for sure. Yeah, I saw the Reverend Horton Heat over there from Houston. So they play in Austin a lot. So, so I've had the opportunity to see a lot of amazing live music, but the, the show that stands out for me, and this is a hilarious story. I don't know, I was probably like 12 to 14 or so, and I was a huge Aerosmith fan. And I wanted to go see this show, and but my dad wasn't really comfortable letting me go on my own. So he went with us. And so it was um, one of my best friends at the time, Molly and my brother and I, and we were at Fiddler's Green in Denver. And so it was kind of, it was an outdoor amphitheater and it had the seat, you know, the normal seats, but then the green behind it. Um, and so we were on our blanket and we were hanging out and all of a sudden this guy comes up and asks, I, I don't know, he just starts talking to us. And he thought it was so cool that my dad had brought us to the show that he offers us front row tickets. <laughs> so we got to see Aerosmith front row, front center seats. Oh got my to God. hold Steven God. Tyler's hand when he was singing Dream On. Oh and my God. I, I still love Aerosmith, but I was really <laughs> obsessed with Aerosmith for a long time after that. I had, I think, 20 cassettes. Aerosmith cassette tapes at one time. <laughs> That's funny. I I lived with this girl that she was obsessed with Aerosmith and mm -hmm. she would turn Aerosmith up so loud and just <laughs> jam. And I never heard, I mean, I never listened to Aerosmith or had any other albums. So there was all these songs I never, ever heard. And it didn't sound like Aerosmith to me. I was like, what is that? That's not Aerosmith. What is it? Because they have a lot of stuff that wasn't big hits. So it's kind of funny. And she would just jam out. Dude, she loved Aerosmith. Sounds like you and her will probably hang out. I've gotten to meet a lot of a lot of artists in Austin. I met a band that I like, which actually their lead singer died, but I got to meet him was Power Trip, which is a thrash metal band out of Dallas, Texas. And I got to meet those guys once. I also got to meet uh, Tommy Victor from Prong, which is another one of my favorite bands. I like that industrial metal stuff. I always, always into that stuff. So that was cool. I got to shake his hand because because my friend, this girl, is a friend of mine, she was really good friends, grew up with that their bass player at the time. So I got to meet him and, you know, yeah, I was that was pretty cool i think it's just amazing being able to to meet the artists that you admire yeah yeah for sure actually i've met reverend horn heat too those guys uh and I, when i was a kid i was smoking a joint in the line <laughs> and i was like hey man they were walking by and i was like hey man you want to hit and they were like no thanks <laughs> <laughs> And I was that's like, what? Yeah. You don't want to smoke weed? You know what I mean? That's what I thought to myself. But of course, now that I look back, I'm like, of course, you didn't want to take a hit off some high school kid's joint on the side of the road. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> so, so I was talking about collecting tapes. Croy, is there anything else that, that you collect? Oh, I collect all sorts of junk to make art out of. I also collect, um, well, you know, I collect a lot of cr minerals, but I don't have them out. They're put away because, um, That's cool, though. but I love minerals, really incredible looking minerals. I'd love that stuff. So I have tons of these crazy crystals and, and uh, geological oddities, you know, and slices. Cause, and also, oh yeah. And I got these, these cool things. Well, this is not, from Africa. I made this one, but these, these are all from Africa. Cool, weird objects. So cool. Look at that. Like, what is that? All these oh, weird gosh. things, you know? Like, Ooh. how cool is that? You know? Look at this one. This is really cool. 
So, and I guess these were like some kind of things that you put on an altar, like as a like um, sacrifice, or I don't know about a sacrifice, like a, but like a token or yeah, it's just yeah, like yeah, whatever you call it. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, so uh, that's what the guy told me. I mean, who knows? But you know, I just thought they were so cool, so I bought all of these, and I was gonna make necklaces out of them or something, you know, bracelets. But I haven't gotten around to it still. And then I got some weird things, but yeah, I kind of just have it to play with. I thought it was interesting. I didn't know about the the minerals and and crystals you mentioned because you you do say in your artist statement that that is kind of an inspiration for for the art that you make is the patterns that occur in nature naturally oh, yeah. and how you're kind of playing that oh yeah for sure i love like really aged and gnarly looking things like really old looking steel pieces that are i love the pitted you know rawness of it or you know there's some projects that i'm going to work on soon that uh uh, where I well actually I actually have a lot of um, steel that's all really old and beaten up up in Colorado that I have to pick up and um, it's a bunch of scrap metal but it's really old been worn down you know over the years and it's heavy plate and I'm gonna make sculptures out of that and little you know pieces oddities and stuff um, yeah but I love that I love the way I love rocks and stones and I mean I one of my favorite things to do is to walk down riverbeds and look at the cool stones the river stones and and in fact I got some incredible river stones that I got from my mom's place here's one these are my lifting stones see look at that <laughs> oh, cool so that's one that's yeah so look at you can see how big it is but it's 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 a perfectly smooth river rock and this is kind of a rough one this is my friend's he brought it over and that's much heavier i love that you both are lifting your stones together that is so <laughs> he hasn't come over here yet he just brought it over but <laughs> supposedly we're gonna do it supposedly it's even better <laughs> yeah 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 my rock over <laughs> i'll bring over yeah. my kettlebells and we yeah yeah <laughs> well i want to get a bigger kettlebell i like kettlebells you can, like, weld handles onto the rocks yeah well i've thought about that actually the only thing is rocks are not as heavy as metal because steel is so much denser so um it'd have to be a big ass rock you know i i thought about that to make a kind of flintstone kettlebells mm -hmm. bolt a big handle into the kettlebell it would be cool i could do it and i probably will eventually just to make it happen well my former kettlebell instructor has a youtube channel now as well so maybe we can collaborate with her cool. if interested in. well you know what's funny i did a commercial for um for the iron man kettlebell i did a commercial in my old shop had my forge going and was messing with this thing in the fire and then put the torch on it and weld so i took an old kettlebell that they had already and i welded you know on it so it could get the so it could look like i was making the kettlebell and stuff what and that's actually this kettlebell right, right here i'll show you oh on it that's the brand on it you ever heard of that they make, they make kettlebells and workout things but i'll show you i'm going to switch this but yeah, you can look it up on YouTube. It's on there for on it. It's a commercial for the Iron Man kettlebell. See, and I welded it right there and they gave it this kettlebell to me. See, so I grinded the weld. I grinded the weld off so it looked pretty sort of. And this comes up, you know, when, when you're creative, you can't help but be creative and it's not just gonna, ex you know, stop at making painting. It extends into kettlebells and lifting rocks. Sure. Those are the kind of things we do so we can keep going, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, that's why I do it. Cause I want to be able to, I don't want, cause I have plenty of friends that have taken their backs out, you know, lifting stuff and, and they got permanent injury, injury you know, and I don't want to do that. I want to be able to work for till I'm 150. No, we got to take care of ourselves mentally and, and physically and, whatever that means. Yes, I'm, that's for sure. I'm super into it.
Well, it was yeah. so much fun talking to you guys and, and introducing you guys. Maybe you met briefly in the real world. Croy and I definitely went to see gold in general, but I don't think I got the opportunity to introduce you guys. So it was really fun to be able to do that tonight. And hopefully we can do that in the real world sooner than later. Yes, we will. We could do it outside in the sun. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. before you go, Croy, I'm creating yes. a list of favorite movies by creative people. And it could be like your favorite movie ever, uh, favorite recent movie, favorite movie when you were a kid. Well, one of my favorite movies that I just watched recently was Brazil. I don't know if I've seen that. It's a Terry Gilliam movie. It's amazing. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Time Bandits, Brazil, and he does a, yeah, I like, love those movies. Time Bandits is another one of my favorite movies ever. And then, and actually, if you watch Brazil, you will see why I like eclectic crazy stuff. That is the wildest. <laughs> I mean, the sets are so incredible in that movie and you're just like, yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great. Terry Gilliam is probably one of my favorite artists ever, probably. See, it's I mean, all connected. Colored yeah. lights, good music, you know, <laughs> wild art of all kinds, you know, <laughs> yes. And lifting her up. Lifting rocks definitely helps strengthen myself so that I can move some of my art around too because some of it gets pretty heavy. Well, thank you both of you so much for joining tonight. Either of you have any, any shout outs to anybody? Shout out to, to Ryan Scott and Aaron's over there at Metalwork Austin and uh, Kim yeah. Hargrove over here in Santa Fe. Uh, I don't know, uh, William Coburn, what up? A big part <laughs> of my motivation for the show is keeping people creative and connected. So thank you so much for anybody who's listening. And if you enjoyed the conversation, keep it going. Like, comment, subscribe. Let us know what other conversations or content you might want to see. And overall, we really appreciate you. It's a brand new show. So thank you guys for being on the show. Thank you for everybody for listening. Just, just really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. We'll talk soon. All right. Over and out. Over and out. <laughs>